Uh, we copy Roger. Uh, I-50 is telling me that they are complete with this SO, but they would appreciate it if you did not power down and just leave this going until you come back in the afternoon, except for turning off the laser and the backlight because they're both run by battery. Your DCE activity for this afternoon at 3 hours, 52 minutes has been canceled. Uh, you need to go to your TPR. However, you will have some CM1 power-up procedures to do later on at approximately 5 hours. Wait a minute. Does that mean I don't have anything to do now for an hour and a half? That's affirmative. I'm sorry, Ann, you got worked up if you responded to that. It is affirmative that you have about an hour and a half of free time right now. Okay, I'd like about 15 minutes of that, but then I'd like to come back here and go ahead and start with some of the IFFD activities for this afternoon, if that's okay. That's okay with us. Just sort of, okay just sort of practice with it and stuff like that. It, uh, I'll just give you a call when I come back in here, okay? Sounds great. I'm be used in Janice's work. Um, for about five minutes. And I'm listening, and can you just give us a little bit of a big picture here? I'm Houston, Janice. Just a heads up, your SARX contact's in about eight minutes. Yep, I'll be there. Chris, thanks for the heads up. Uh, yes, Janice, we were just conferring on the big picture. Uh, the DCE activities have been deleted for this shift. This is due to the limited amount of fuel they have available, and they... Their science team would like to rethink their test points to be performed and ensure that they get maximum science return through the end of the mission. And that, so they have pulled out all of their activities in the timeline today. We are trying to reschedule some CM1 on you after your meal, which is different than what we told you in daily status. Okay, and thanks for the update. We appreciate it. Good evening, uh, Mark. Uh, we're right in the handover between the uh, red shift who's just waking up and the blue shift who's getting ready to wind down. Janice has just finished her exercise for the day, and uh, Roger's still back in the lab doing some experiments, but hopefully he'll be up here shortly. And uh, I guess we're approaching the halfway point in the mission, and it really feels to us on board like we're falling into a steady routine. Um, but the minute you say the word routine, you have to step back and glance out the window and when you do that and see the beautiful earth whizzing by, it reminds you that this is anything but routine. It reminds me of where we are and why we're here. And it makes us appreciate all the great work that uh, the folks at Mission Control and at Marshall have done in pulling this mission together and supporting us uh, through it. And it makes us realize that uh, a space mission is anything but routine in, in all aspects from the groundbreaking science we're doing to uh, just what it takes to keep people flying safely in space. So today we're going to give you just kind of a rundown of a halfway through the mission type day in space. And it turns out it was Janice's half day off. So she got to do all kinds of neat things. And we'll show you what astronauts do on their days off, or at least what Janice did on her day off. And then uh, I'm doing a little experiment in the back uh, called the LIF Sure Cell. I'll show you that. Okay, this is me doing the uh, LIF Sure Cell experiment. And a uh, big picture on this is the materials uh, processing experiment to end at measuring the diffusion coefficient of uh, various atoms through different materials in space. What you see me there doing is rotating this shear cell, and what that does basically is they warm this darn thing up, and then atoms diffuse through the materials, and then at the end of the uh, run, we actually crank it, which breaks it into small pieces, and then on the ground, they can measure how far the atoms diffuse, and from that, really determine the diffusion properties how far the uh, atoms were able to migrate. And on Earth, because atoms weigh different amounts, you can't ever uh, totally measure that property. Uh, knowing that property will help us uh, design better materials process for everything from computers to uh, materials. And here's Roger. And this is a view of an experiment we're doing on called the internal flow of uh, and fluid dynamics of droplets. And uh, above the metal pedestal there, you can see a small droplet of 
glycerin and water levitate. We're doing materials with different viscosities or different consistencies because they have different properties of levitation. The application for this would be to the uh, shapes of planets that are gaseous like Saturn and Jupiter and uh, for the formation of stars, the sun and other kinds of uh, uh, astrophysical bodies as well as uh, any kind of fluids and droplets here on the ground. This is something else I like to do on my day off. I first got interested in flying in space from reading science fiction. You can't really, there we go, A Wrinkle in Time is the name of that book. That's the first science fiction book I ever read by Madeline Langell when I was in sixth grade and it got me interested in the space program and I'm still reading science fiction and I like to bring science fiction up with me and read it by Earthlight, which is sunlight reflected off the Earth. You can, it's hard to tell in this shot, but it is bright enough to read with that light. It's just like reading in a room at home and having that connection, having read science fiction to get me started on this path and closing the loop by reading science fiction in space is really special to me. Well, good morning, Lieutenant Commander Susan Still and Commander Jim Household. This is Peggy O'Leary with Channel 12 in Augusta. How are you this morning, or evening in your case? And good morning, Peggy, and uh, we're doing just great up here. Friday, we celebrated the birth of a nation, but also this weekend, we celebrated the rebirth of the excitement of space exploration. Susan, we are so proud that someone from Augusta can be a part of that. Tell us a little bit about your mission. Peggy, our mission is a microgravity science mission. We're up here for 16 days studying the effects of microgravity on combustion and material science. Uh, and the purpose is twofold, but the main purpose is to make somehow make life better on Earth, perhaps more efficient fuel burning, less pollutants in the air, better metals for aircraft engines, and that sort of thing. Indeed, this is a very important mission. When it came down early in April, of course, we were all disappointed. But were you surprised at the quick turnaround for your crew, the payload in Columbia? I tell you, Peggy, they did an awesome job getting this orbiter ready to fly again so quickly. This is the quickest turnaround ever for a space shuttle. And the crew, we were just ready to go. We were well trained for STS-83, and so we just needed to maintain our proficiency leading into STS-94. To talk with your family at all since you've been in space. I talked with a niece and nephew the other day on the ham radio, and I talked with my boyfriend on air to ground one time, and I hope to speak with my dad in a couple of days. Well, you know, Susan, you don't have to wait a couple of days to speak to your father. He's here with us now, live in the studios. Dr. Joseph, still, do you have any questions for your daughter, Susan? I have any questions. I'd just like to tell her hello from my mother and myself. I'm glad to see that she's doing well. Hi, Dad. Do you have any puppies left? One left, and his name is Astro. What, what have you done today? What's your day been like so far? It's been a very busy day, actually. I spent about an hour in what we call the WCS, which is kind of the bathroom, uh, tidying it up. <laughs> I've cleaned windows. I've um, done some maintenance on our ham radio system to get it working a little bit better. And I've worked a lot on the computers. I've done a, um, a project called uh, WDAS, which is a wireless data acquisition system, and it's something that we're going to be using while we assemble space stations. What it is is there's some temperature probes out in the payload bay, and we have a system where we can monitor the temperatures out there. This will be very important during space station because it's so cold up in space when the sun's not shining on you. You're cleaning the bathrooms. A woman's work is never done, even in space. So. Um, first, I'd like to address that woman's work part. It's uh, because I'm a pilot that I do all those jobs. I just wanted to make sure that was clear, not because I'm a woman. The pilot's job is uh, cleanliness. That's a space lab for uh, LIS. It's acronym, but what this device does for us is very valuable. It allows us to practice the landing task all throughout this extended duration mission uh, so that 16 
about trying to land for the first time. Uh, every day, uh, Susan fires us up, and she and I make a run or two on the uh, on the pilot simulator. You can see from the screen here that it's uh, for a desktop kind of simulator. It's actually pretty high fidelity. The control response is certainly not exactly the same as a shuttle or as a shuttle training aircraft, so you can't really uh, hang your hat on its flying qualities. But it does get your brain working again as to what you ought to be looking at and when you need to be looking at certain parameters. Uh, working on lining up the ball bar, working on the airspeed, working on the sight picture, uh, just the mechanics of landing the shuttle. And I think this is a valuable tool. You'll see uh, Susan's landing here just at or beyond the uh, touchdown markers, which is where we try to touch the shuttle down nowadays. So I'm making some pilot runs together as a crew. Here's Don, and here I'm just going to show you is just uh, the path from the flight deck over to the lab. Here's the mid-deck. He goes through the airlock hatch. And uh, you'll see he does a high-speed 180 pass with Susan coming the other way. Now, the tunnel there has a lot of our uh, laundry in it, both clean and dirty. And it's a good storage place for a number of different items. Here we bounce up into the lab, and you can see the uh, the blue shift already at work there, Janet from the left, and uh, Roger at the far end. People told me that uh, fresh food was really nice to have, but that it ran out after a few days. So. Uh, I knew that growing sprouts on the ground was pretty easy to do, and I thought that uh, growing them on orbit might be possible. The people in the food lab really helped out a lot. We got some alfalfa seeds into a food bag and uh, devised a system for adding water to it without letting the sprouts out. And then all we needed was a way to uh, get the water out without gravity. So and by connecting bags together and creating a little bit of centrifugal force, we could uh, squeeze the water out of the bags. So the sprouts are growing along, and uh, with a little bit of luck, we'll be able to eat them soon enough. So we'll uh, end up here with a couple of Earth-Ops shots. This is the uh, the border between uh, 